morning, everybody. I'm glad to see you guys out today. Kind of a crazy drive-in. Um, hey, so we are in uh, the series of misbehaving, and this was a, a sermon series that we had talked about for a while. Um, just thing I kind of focus on maybe some of the um, not so pretty stories of the Bible and the the people that maybe. Um, didn't really make the right choices, but maybe uh, we could look at them and kind of learn some stuff from them. And, and last week, uh, Corey stood up here and he talked about some stories or some times that he struggles with misbehaving. And, and I was trying to think of, um, you know, stories in my own life. And, and I went out with uh, my parents Friday night for dinner and I said, hey, tell me some times as a kid that I misbehaved. And they couldn't think of anything because I was a good kid. Um, I mean, they actually thought about it and thought about it, and they couldn't think of anything. Now, um, I mean, there's things that my parents don't know, um, but my mom is going to watch the video podcast, um, so we're just not going to talk about it um, because I want to remain her favorite child. So um, that's not true. I'm obviously the second favorite. My, my brother has me beat. Um, but, you know, I went to a Bible college. I was trying to think of stories. Jeff, you know, knows... In Bible college, misbehaving is like, it's not even, like, we got in trouble for stupid things that, like, you know, you went to a normal college, they wouldn't even blink an eye at. And in college, I um, got to uh, meet the president of the college a few times um, because of misbehaving and just silly Bible college stuff. So, um, but really, never really went through like that. that. But I, I was trying to think of um, somebody in the Bible that represented misbehaving. And, and I just kept coming back to Samson. Samson's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, and, I, and honestly, I think Samson's probably one of the biggest examples of misbehaving that I could think of. And, and I remember growing up in church and hearing the story of Samson and Delilah. And then I remember this moment when I was probably in my early 20s and I went back and I read the entire story of Samson. And I remember reading it and thinking, oh my gosh, there are so many things that my Sunday school teachers left out. There are so many things that I never learned about in, in Bible school. And, and I always kind of had this idea that Samson was this huge biblical hero. And then when you go back and read it, it's, it's more of a cautionary tale. It's more of a... Um, you know, a story of you, you probably, you know, you shouldn't go down this road, but it's also a story of what God can do and also a story of what God will do in a life with someone that just screws up over and over and over again. And so there's a few things before I, I go in, because I just want to start at the beginning of the story of Samson and just go all the way through. But before I go into that, there are a few things that you kind of need to know about Samson, maybe to think about before we get into it. And the first one, I'm going to be talking about this a lot today. This is something that's called the Nazarite vow. And when I talk about the Nazarite vow, this is what I'm talking about. The, the Nazarite vow was, was something that somebody would take um, for like a, maybe a month or two. They would say, you know what, I'm going to take some time. I'm going to take this vow and I'm going to spend some time growing closer to God, spend some time praying. Maybe the closest thing we have to that now is um, if you know what fasting is, some people choose to maybe go a day without food or to maybe go a couple weeks without social media and instead you use that time um, to spend praying and growing closer to God. So the people would take this vow, but it was meant to kind of be temporary. At most, some people um, may take it up to a year uh, may take it up to a couple years, but it was this kind of brief moment in your life that you just needed to spend a little extra time with God. And the word Nazarite means separated. The reason it means separated is because you, by taking this, you separate yourself from maybe some of the cultural norms. And there was three main rules that you followed in the Nazarite vow. The first thing that you did was you did not eat <coughs> or drink or touch anything that was made from grapes. So that means grapes, raisins, um, you know, not a big deal. But this also, included, this also included wine, which if you know about that time period, that, that wine was very much a staple of, of your normal day. It was something that you had um, for every meal. There were traditional feasts and celebrations that you would go to, and it was customary that everybody drink wine. 
But you, by taking this vow, you were supposed to stay away from that. You were separated from that. The se second thing that you couldn't do is that um, you could not touch a dead body. And again, you're probably like, okay, well, that's not that big of a deal. It hasn't, you know, it's been a while since I've touched a dead body. Um, and, and I preached about this probably 10 years ago. And the more I read this, the more I thought about it this time, this also would mean animals, which would mean you can't touch a dead animal, which again, probably not something you do every day, but that would include meat. That would include probably one of the, that was the main thing that you had to eat. And so, so by taking this vow, you made yourself a vegetarian for that short time that you went through this. And then the third thing that you did was you didn't cut your hair. This was kind of a um, outward um, kind of symbol that you were taking this vow. So when you were walking and you saw somebody walking down the street that had extremely long hair, you most likely would look at them and say, well, they are spending some extra time with God. They are going through something right now, and they are taking this Nazarite vow upon themselves. And so you can actually read about this in Numbers. Um, God kind of explains to those people what to do. And so I need you to think about these three rules, and I'm going to keep them up here as we talk about Samson. But the second thing that I want you to think about when we talk about Samson is because I think that maybe we have a little misconception. Because when I, when I say Samson, those of you that know who Samson is, what do you immediately think of? What? Starts with an S. Everybody's whispering, strength. Everybody thinks strength. And, and I Googled pictures of Samson, like, you know, paintings and illustrations and um, all the different pictures that were in, like, children's Bibles. And every picture I could find of Samson had this long flowing hair, and he was just absolutely ripped. And I started thinking about this, and I had, I had read a little bit, because when you read through the book of Judges, the entire book of Judges where we find the story of Samson are stories where God takes ordinary people and he uses them to do amazing things. You know, there was uh, stories of uh, Gideon where he was going up against an army of like 200,000 men. And he put together an army and God said, no, that's too big. That's too big. That's too big. And he narrows it down to just like a, just a handful of people. And God would do this with these ordinary people. He'd do these amazing things because he wants all the glory and all the credit to point to him. So the reason I say this is that if Samson was this huge Hercules-looking beast of a man, when he would do these amazing physical feats, people would look at him and say, yeah, of course he could do that. Of course he could do that. He's big. He's strong. He probably works out all the time. If Samson was this big, strong guy, nothing he did would ever point to God. So I want to challenge you to think of something, because this is, this is what I truly believe, is that I think that Samson probably looked like an ordinary man. I don't think Samson had these huge, bulging muscles. I think Samson probably looked a little bit more like me than maybe what these, these pictures you do. I, I told this story the very first time I preached, that this, my nickname uh, in Pittsburgh was given to me by this little inner-city school kid that um, yelled out the bus and said, Yo, noodles! And I turned around, and he was talking to me, and from then on, everybody... And my youth group called me noodles because of my long, skinny arms. And so now when you go and you're like, hey, you should come to my church. My minister looks like Samson. And No, but I, I don't think Samson was this huge, strong guy. I think he looked very ordinary. And I think God was going to use that to be able to, when he did these huge, amazing physical strength things that God wanted it to be so that when people saw that, there was no way he could do that except through God. So keep those two things in mind as we kind of go through this, because I'm going to kind of be referencing back to a lot of this. Um, but I want to look at where we find God's people when we first read about Samson. We're, we're covering uh, four chapters in Judges, Judges 14 through 16. And the book of Judges is this, this cool book. Um, it's a lot of uh, fun stories. Um, it takes place about a thousand years before Jesus. And there's this pattern that you start to see throughout the book of Judges. It says that everybody would start to do 
what was right in their own eyes. And when you do what's right in your own eyes, usually what you're doing is uh, what's the opposite of what is right in God's eyes. And so the, the God's people, the Israelites, they would do this for a while, and they would kind of just do their own thing. They would suffer the consequences. And usually when they suffer the consequences, that meant that another army would come in and they would take over the land they would be oppressed, they would be living in poverty, and then they would cry out and they would say, God, help us. And even though they've been rebelling against God, God, who's different than you and I, he would be there for them. Because he's gracious and he's merciful and he would help them and he would, he would get them out of whatever situation they were in and he would save the people and redeem them over and over again. And the, the book of Judges, the reason it's called Judges is because God would send a judge to save his people. Think back to Corey last week. If you were here, Corey talked about Ehud. Ehud was a judge that uh, they were God's people were doing what was right in their own eyes. They were conquered by the Moabites. God raised up Ehud, and Ehud, uh, Corey told the story uh, where he stabbed the king, the king that was so fat that the, the sword actually went into his stomach and the fat closed in over the sword. And it's a really kind of fun story to, um, to read. And, and Ehud was the judge that saved the Israelites. And it says that they lived in peace for 80 years. And then Ehud died. And then the next chapter, as soon as you start reading the next chapter, it says, and then God's people and then the Israelites started doing what was right in their own eyes. And then they were conquered by the Canaanites. And then we just kind of go through this entire story again. And this happens over and over and over again. And as you start to read the book of Judges, you can almost sense the fatigue and the, the tiredness of just, oh my gosh, it's, you know, it's happening again. And now there's a new judge and this is going to save us. And we'll be fine for a little while, but it's going to happen again. And this actually happened seven times. And it goes disobedience, oppression, crying out, deliverance. Disobedience, oppression, crying out, deliverance. And this is just the entire book of Judges. And we find ourselves in Judges 13, and it starts out the same way. It says, again, the people of God did what was right in their own eyes. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And this time... The seventh time they were conquered by the Philistines. And so they had been uh, living under their rule. And in this seventh time, this oppression, this was the worst that they had experienced. The Philistines were by far the most um, ruthless and violent army that was kind of around there. They lived by the sea. The, the best picture I could give you of the Philistines would be to kind of picture Vikings. And they came in and they, they took over Israel and the first thing that they did was they went through the land and they took all their swords and all their spears, just leaving them completely helpless. Like there was no way that they could fight back even if they wanted. And then they went in throughout all the land and they would take all their crops. And this would keep everybody tired and hungry and weak and just kind of struggling to get by. And, and then they would start to grow their crops back and then the Philistines would come back in and you know, take everything again. And it, it got to the point where the Israelites... They just couldn't take it anymore. And it was part of that cycle. There was disobedience, there was oppression, and they cried out to God, and they said, God, you've got to help us. There is nothing we can do. And God sends an angel, and he tells this man and woman that, that were unable to have kids, they said, you're gonna have a son, we want you to name him Samson, and when he grows up, he is going to save the Israelites from the Philistines. And then the angel says, there's three rules. There's three things that this, uh, your child needs to follow. They said, one, he cannot drink wine. He cannot touch a dead body. And he should never cut his own hair. And what the angel is saying is that your son is going to live under the Nazarite vow. Remember, something that was meant to be temporary, something that most, most people would only take for maybe a month or two. They said, he said, your son, this is going to be his life. His entire life, he needs to follow these rules. And so we learn about Samson at the beginning of his life, and then Samson grows up, and then we don't see him until he's into adulthood. And Samson's kind of living under the Nazarite vow. Like, he's not motivated to do good. He's not motivated by God to do what's right. When you start to see the story of Samson, he's just motivated, motivated by what feels good. 
He's motivated by his uh, emotions and his feelings. And, and you know as well as I do, when we're motivated by our feelings and our emotions, we usually get ourselves in trouble. And so the story starts out that it's talking about Samson, and, and he sees this Philistine woman. Remember, this was an enemy. This was a, um, a woman that was, that was part of the enemy camp. And he sees her and, and thought she was beautiful, and he, he goes back to his father, and he says, I want this woman. And he said, I want you to go, and I want you to arrange a marriage so I can marry this woman. And then he says, for she is right in my own eyes. Remember, whatever is right in our own eyes is usually wrong in the eyes of God. And Samson is supposed to be different, but he sees this enemy woman, and he says, I have to have her. And so... For some reason, Samson's father, he arranges the marriage. And so Samson is going um, to, to visit his wife. They're going to make some plans for the, the wedding celebration. And, and the Bible mentions that he took a shortcut and he decided to walk through a vineyard. And so right away you see, okay, he's already breaking rule number one because Nazarites that were taking this Nazarite vow, they would stay far away from vineyards because you weren't supposed to be anywhere near it. And then it says that he was attacked by a lion. And this is the first time that we truly see Samson's strength because the Bible says that with no weapons, with just his bare hands, Samson tears the lion into pieces. And the Bible says, as one does with a young goat. Like, we're supposed to know what that means. Like, you know, we all, you know how it is when you tear apart a young goat with your bare hands. And so then it just says he goes into town. He spends a few days getting ready for the wedding. And on his way home, he, he again walks through the vineyard. And this time he sees the lion carcass, the pieces of the lion. And as he walks by, he realizes that um, some bees have made a nest. And he reaches into the lion carcass, you know, rule number two. And he pulls out the honey and he eats it. And so when you, when you first start reading Samson, you can kind of see that the writer wants us to see something. The writer is showing us that, that already Samson has broken rule number one. He's broken rule number two. And it's almost like they're saying, you know, Samson does what he wants whenever he wants, and he doesn't care. And so the, they tell this story, and the wedding takes place. And the Bible says that he was assigned 30 men. And that's because Samson didn't have friends. He had his own wedding party, his own groomsmen assigned to him. And and so the, the wedding takes place, and normally the wedding celebration, it would go on for about seven days. And so he gets married, and he's hanging out with the Philistines. Okay, this was an Israelite hanging out with the enemies. And um, all the men are telling stories, and, and they're making bets, and they're telling riddles. And so Samson says, okay, I've got a, I've got a riddle for you. He, Samson's a little cocky. He's a little uh, sure of himself. And he says, if you can figure this out, I'll give, there's 30 men. I'll give you each a new set of clothing. But he said, if you can't figure this riddle out, then you guys each owe me a set of clothing. And so he, he goes on and he says, out of the eater, something to eat, out of the strong, something sweet, obviously talking about the lion carcass and the bees. And, and so as the celebration's going on, he's just making fun of the men because they can't figure it out. And, and he's just getting on them. And so the Philistine men get so angry that they go to his new wife, his new bride, and they say, you need to tell us you need to figure out the answer to this riddle. And they said, if you can't figure this out, we're just going to kill you and your father. We're just going to burn you guys alive. And so Samson's new bride goes to him, figures out, like begs with him, says, what's, what's the answer to the riddle? Just tell me I want to know. And he said, um, he, he explains it to her. She runs back to the Philistines, tells them the answer, and then they come back to him at the celebration, and they say, well, what's sweeter than honey? What's stronger than a lion? And Samson realizes that he lost the bet. And Samson is ticked. Now Samson owes 30 articles of clothing. And then maybe one of my favorite Bible verses. He says, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found the answer. <laughs> We're just going to leave it right there. Yeah. Not going to go into, it's not a good idea to call your wife a heifer. Um, it's not one of the Nazarite rules. It's, it's just a common sense rule. Um, and so he says this, and he's angry, and he has no money, and so he just leaves. 
And it says that he just, he goes out and the first 30 Philistine men he sees, he just murders them right on the road, takes their clothing, rule number two, touches the dead body, takes all these dead man's clothing back to the, the guys, gives them the clothes, and he's so angry that he just leaves. He leaves his own wedding celebration. He leaves the wedding party. He leaves his new wife, and it says he just goes home and pouts. He's just ticked, and he just, he just leaves it all. So then the next story, as they start to go in, Samson comes to his senses. It's, this has been probably a few weeks, if not months, and he eventually goes back. He goes back to find his wife, and when he goes back, the, his father-in-law meets him and says, Hey, we thought you were done. She went ahead and remarried. And so again, Samson gets angry. And I think by now you realize that, that Samson's got some serious anger issues. And it says that, that Samson went into the woods. And if you are some sort of animal, extreme animal lover, PETA enthusiast, I want you to do earmuffs right now. Okay, because this is, this is weird. It says that he went and he gathered up 300 foxes. I don't know how. You know, how many foxes have you seen in your lifetime? And in just a short period of time, he gathers up foxes. I have no idea. He takes their tails. He ties them together into pairs. I don't know how. And he takes a torch, and he puts it in between their tails, and he lights it on fire and throws the foxes out and just lets them scurry all around the Philistine land. Now, what happened was he completely burned up their entire crops. He completely just demolished all of their, their olive trees and all of their vineyards, everything that they had, all the food that they had, completely burned up by these this 300 foxes all tied together. That's one of my favorite stories. And I never knew that when I was a kid. Like, why are we leaving this out at Sunday school? That's so cool. <laughs> and so then you start to see that it becomes this back and forth and back and forth because then the Philistines are angry and they said, okay, you burnt our fields, now we're gonna burn your wife. And, and they take his, his wife, they take her father and they, they burn her alive, they kill her. And so then Samson retaliates and it's like, when your kids are fighting like mine have done all weekend and it's just one does something and then the other one does something. And, and so now Samson, he just starts killing Philistines. And he's just, he's just running around killing people until he eventually runs back home and he hides. And he goes to a cave because he knows that, that he, he started a little bit more trouble than what he has in the past. And so the Philistines, they gather up with an, an army of a thousand men. And the thousand men, they, they come into the, the Israelite area and they line up for war. They're getting ready for battle, and they're getting ready just to attack the Israelites because they've had enough. And, and they know that Samson is an Israelite, so they're just going to take it out on the Israelite people. And it says the Israelites came out to the, the army as they're lining up and getting ready to attack. And they're saying, listen, we don't like him either. Like, we don't want him. We don't want to claim him. Let us go get him and bring him to you, and you just leave us out of it. And so the Philistines, they accept the offer. The Israelites go, they eventually find Samson hiding in a, a cave, and they say, listen, we need to tie you up. We're going to turn you over to the Philistines like we've just had enough. And so Samson, he's cool with it. They tie him up. Uh, they drag him up to the Philistines, and there's this, men, this army of a 1,000 men, and they sit, it says they start celebrating. And so they give him Samson. They walk away, and they, and they finally done. They finally captured Samson. And then it says that Samson broke the ropes like they were nothing. And he reaches down and he finds the carcass of a donkey, again, rule number two. And he picks up the jawbone and he uses the jawbone like a sword and kills all 1,000 Philistine soldiers. And then Samson, he celebrates by going into the nearest Philistine town and finds himself a prostitute. Like, not one of the Nazarite vow rules, but... Probably a rule for the Israelites that you stay away from prostitutes. And, and so this is all the stuff that's happening with Samson, right? Like growing up, like I talked about, like the, remember the flannel board and they put the pictures up? Like they didn't have flannel graph characters of Samson with a jawbone killing men. And they didn't have you know, Samson tying foxes together. They didn't have a prostitute on the flannel board. Like this was stuff that's in the Bible, 
about the story of Samson that, honestly, I don't think I really knew until I was an adult. You see, like I said before, if you would see Samson on the street and you would see the long hair, you would know immediately that he was taking the Nazarite vow. And you would look and say, man, that guy must be very dedicated because his hair is very long. It's been a long time since he's cut his hair. This guy must have so much self-control. But when you start to read these stories and the things that we see in Judges, you see that he has no self-control and he and he's struggles with anger and vengeance. And then we come to the part of the story that probably you're most familiar with. Um, it's the one that, that I, I know I was taught the most growing up. And, and that's when Samson falls in love with another Philistine woman, another woman that's part of the enemy camp named Delilah. And at this time, Samson's just completely head over heels, and, and they are together. And as the story goes, Delilah one day says, Samson, what makes you so strong? Now, remember, going back to when I said what I think Samson looks like, if Samson looked like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, I think she wouldn't have asked that question because his muscles make him so strong. I think he, she's looking and saying, what makes you be able to do all these amazing things? Because you do not look like some kind of huge, strong man. And she's kind of got ulterior motives. And he's kind of just playing around. And he says, you know what? If you can go get seven green vines, and if I'm tied up, then, then I lose all my power. And so he tells her this. And that night, he goes to bed, just like any other night. I assume that he was drunk. And that's just me. That's nothing biblical. Um, but because he slept through her tying him up with seven green vines. Um, and then she starts screaming, Samson, the Philistines are here. The Philistines are here. They're going to kill you. He jumps up, snaps the vines, looks around. Um, nothing there. Goes back to sleep. Then this happens again. Okay, first time there's probably some red flags like, guys, you, like, you told your girl something, and then she uses it against you. Um, you know, there's got to be some, like, warning signals going off. But Samson ignores it. You know, and, and when we've gone through something, it's like the whole hindsight is twenty twenty. Like, when you're going through something, you're just not thinking clearly. Samson ignores it, and because he, he just, I think he thinks nobody can hurt him. He's just so distracted by his infatuation with Delilah. I mean, you might even say that Samson's love for Delilah at this point is probably more than his love for God, if he even has any love for God at this point. And so this happens again because she says, Samson, obviously you, obviously you lied to me. What is it that makes you so strong? Like, where does your strength come from? And he says, well, if you just go buy brand new ropes and then tie me up with them, um, same thing. Wakes up screaming. Uh, he, she wakes him up screaming. He jumps up, ready for a fight. Nothing. Um, then he, he said, he's getting a little closer. He said, okay, if you can just braid my hair into seven braids. Same thing. Goes to sleep the next night. Braids his hair. Starts screaming. Jumps up, ready to fight. Nobody there. Like, this just keeps happening. He's got to know. He's got to know that, I mean, she is a Philistine. And so she begs and pleads and says, man, if you really love me, you would tell me. You would tell me what gives you your strength. And he gives in and he says, it's the hair on my head. He's not saying the hair is what makes him strong, but he's saying I, I've taken this Nazarite vow since I, I've been born. And if, if you know, I break this vow, if my head is shaved, then, then I no longer have the strength, this power. And the same thing happens, but this time she knows that she's got him. And she gets the other Philistines. They're waiting outside. He falls asleep. She shaves his head. And this time she starts screaming, and, and he jumps up, and he can't overpower the Philistines. They take him captive. They take him back to their camp. And this man who was supposed to save Israel from the Philistines, I mean, he's completely wasted his life. He's made a slave. They said that they used him to move the grindstone that would grind up their grain. This was uh, usually something that they would use, like have an animal do. And remember, he's not strong now. He doesn't have that strength, so he's actually suffering. And he's actually, you know, having to work um, day in and day out as a slave. And then they said that they gouged out his eyes, both of his eyes, which is almost kind of uh, poetic justice for someone that struggled so much with what they saw. Like when, they, when he saw something, he wanted it. And then 
the end of the story, they gouge out his eyes. This stuff is personal. The Philistines, they wanted him to suffer. They weren't just going to kill him right away now that they had him and, and he was no longer strong. They wanted him to spend the rest of his life suffering and in pain. And this went on for a while. Um, the Bible doesn't say how long, but it does say that strength, or Samson's hair did grow back. And I guess as a kid, and it, just always hearing this, I always just pictured like his strength came from his hair. So his hair grew back, now he was strong. Um, but remember, it was, it was God. And Samson turned his back on God. But when you read this story, you see that God didn't turn his back on Samson. Because one day the Philistines, they were throwing this celebration, and they said that there was over 3,000 of them that came to this giant party, this giant celebration, and they were celebrating the fact that they had conquered Israel, that they had conquered Samson, the strongest man alive. And they were worshiping this made-up fish god called Dagon. And they had this giant party, and everybody was there, and all the Philistine leaders and the entire Philistine army all of the, the Dagon religious leaders were there, and they said, you know what, let's bring Samson out, and let's put him on display. You know, this is the, we've conquered him, and we want him here so we can just celebrate the fact that, that he's no longer killing us and doing all this crazy stuff. And so they bring him out. It says that Samson, blind and weak, he just leans up against the pillar it says that Samson prayed. Samson cried out, just like the Israelites, just like that pattern that we saw with the Israelites where there, there was disobedience and then there was oppression. And then they cried out to God. And Samson cried out to God and said, God, can you just give me strength just one more time? It's as though Samson realized after all these years that it was God that gave him this power. And it was nothing that he did on his own. And just like with the Israelites, when they cried out, God was there. And it says that when he felt the power come back into him, he grabbed the two pillars and he, he pulled them together, causing the entire structure to fall down. And it says that it killed all 3,000 plus Philistines that was in attendance, as well as killing Samson himself. And it was this act, this final thing that he did, it, it saved Israel. It got them out from underneath the Philistines. And you can read about the Philistines because there's this moment the Philistines never recovered from. Their entire army was gone. All their leaders were gone. The, all their religious leaders, every, all the government authority was gone. It was almost as if Samson wiped the Philistines off of the map. And so that's the story of Samson. That's where Judges leaves it right there at the end of chapter 16. And we read this and we say, man, like his life was a mess. Samson's life was just one bad decision after another, after another. And it's like every time he had a choice to make, he chose the wrong path every time. See, Samson had this great strength, but he had no wisdom and he had no self-control. That's what got him in so much trouble. It was this man who just continually followed his own desires over and over and over again. And in the end, when he decided that he loved Delilah more than he loved God, that's when we see his life crumble. That's when we see that the, the strongest man in the Bible was defeated by his own sin. Now, as I was working on this... Um, you know, sitting at my computer, I just Googled Samson. I just wanted to see, you know, where is he mentioned in the Bible, you know, besides Judges. And one other verse come up. One other verse um, in Hebrews chapter 11 came up, and it, it mentions Samson's name. Now, if you know anything about Hebrews 11, oftentimes Hebrews 11 is referred to as like the faith hall of fame. It's like where the, the all-stars of the Bible are mentioned. And you can go through it, and you can read it, and you can see people like Noah. And you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Noah built an ark. You can read people like Abraham. Like, I mean, Abraham's entire life embodied, embodied faith. And it'll say like Moses, and you're like, yeah, he, he rescued the Israelites from Egypt. And all these people, there's good reason as to why they made it into this, this chapter. And then in Hebrews 11.32... 
Uh, the writer says, I could go on and on, but I've run out of time. There's so many more. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And so that you read this, and there's all these deserving names, and then there's Samson. And as I'm writing this, I, I'm, I kept asking myself, like nothing about his life said this is a faithful man. This is a good man that we should emulate, that we should base our lives off of. And I just kept asking myself, why? Why Hebrews 11? Why did he make it into that Hall of Fame kind of all-star? And I think it comes down to the end of his life, that final act that took out all of the Philistines. Because when Samson was born, he took on the Nazarite vow, but he did that. He followed all three of these rules only because... The angel said so, only because his parents raised him that way, right? And I think there's probably some of you here that may come to church because your parents brought you as a child. And even maybe into your 30s and 40s, you're like, oh, you know, it's just something you do. And you're just, this is the hardest part of youth ministry is so much of youth ministry is teenagers that, that only come to church because their parents make them come to church. But this is also the most rewarding part of youth ministry. This is also the most rewarding part of ministry is when people get to that point that this is no longer just because my parents. Like, this is a faith that I want to have for myself. See, this wasn't something Samson took seriously. This was just part of his life. Like, his parents all his life just said, this is what you're going to do. you got to follow these rules. And he landed in prison, and I think he learned some tough lessons. I think he realized that when he was in prison that he, he's free to choose what he does throughout his life, but he's not free from the consequences. He's not free from the consequences of his choices. But secondly, most importantly, I think he realized that God was there for him all along, that even though he turned his back on God so many times, God hadn't turned his back on him. But it was up to Samson. Because Samson would have grown up he hearing stories of the Bible, of, of the, or stories of the Israelites, how they, they screwed up over and over, and they got themselves into trouble, and they called out to God, and he was there. And Samson realized that he's just like Israel, just doing his own thing. And he gets himself into trouble, and I think he realized, if I can just call out to God, I believe that God's going to be there. And he does, and God gives him his strength back, and he uses it. And it says that Samson killed more Philistines that day than he did his entire life when he was alive. And so even though he turned his back on God, not once did God turn his back on Samson. And that is what we call grace. And that, when we read this messed up, misbehaving story of Samson, we can still read it, and we can still see that God is there and that God's grace is there. You see, the story of Samson, I think the story of Samson is the story of us because we chase after our own desires. We go after what we think is going to make us happy. We screw up, and if we could just cry out to God, then God is there. I think the story of Israel, that's the story of us, the, you know, the disobedience, the oppression, the crying out. But then there can be deliverance. You see, after a while, the, the Israelites got to a point where they said, this just keeps happening. Like we screw up, we cry out to God, and he sends us a judge, and it's great, and Samson is great, and Ehud and Gideon and all these people are great, but it just keeps going, and the cycle just keeps going. And they said, man, we just need someone to come and save us once and for all. If just, is there just a judge that could just take care of this once and for all for us? And that judge is what we find in the New Testament with Jesus. We have that same judge today. And he's ready and willing to save us. But listen, it is up to us. Like we misbehave and we screw up and we fall short, but it is up to us to cry out. It is up to us to turn to God and say, God, I can't do this on my own. Like I'm screwing up left and right. And yeah, I kind of turn things around, but then the next thing I know, I'm getting myself into trouble again. So this story has less, less to do with Samson and more to do with God. Because this is a living lesson of the grace of God, of how a man could be beaten and humiliated and blinded by his own stupidity. This is a lesson of how a man reached rock bottom, but yet he turned around and he found that God was waiting for him all along. In the end, all he did was turn around and find God there. 
so when I look at this and I, I read Hebrews 11, I, I guess the question is, is Samson a hero? Is he a bi- biblical hero? Is he a hero worth emulating? Probably not the beginning stories, obviously. Um, you know, his life was an, an entire mess, but, but in the end, he chose to say yes. He chose to call out to God. He cho- chose and he was fulfilled. He fulfilled the purpose that he was created for even though he wasted his entire life. I mean, this came down to the last five minutes of his life and he got it together. So maybe the greatest lesson of this story is that the God would rather forgive you than judge you. Because God wants to forgive you and he wants you to get your life back on track so that you can fulfill the purpose for which God created for you. I just want to ask that we stand as we close and we sing. I know some of you are there right now. You, you've screwed up. There, there's things that you've done. I, I think we look at this series of misbehaving, and there's probably some of you that's like, you could probably tell my story, and, and that, would, that would fit into this idea of misbehaving. But Samson's not remembered for the screw-ups. He's not remembered for his downfalls. He's not mentioned in Hebrews 11 because of all the stupid things he's done. He's, he's mentioned because of how he handled all those times that he screwed up all the ugly stuff in his life, of the the faith that sprouted out of all that mess that he had created. And if you're here now and you've got that stuff in your past and you're like, you you know, this is this series is all about me. If you're going through it right now or, or none of us are immune to it, we all have times that we, we continue to screw up. Remember, it's not that what we've done that God is going to look at. It's not all the bad times, all the things that we've messed up. That's not the stuff that God's going to look at. He's going to look at how we handle it. He's going to look at that what we've learned from it and how we've allowed this misbehaving and these downfalls and these times that we've screwed up, how we have taken that and we've grown from that and how we can use that to shine brighter for Jesus. And that's what matters. Let's pray. God, I thank you that, God, I thank you that you're not like us. That God, just like the Israelites, screwed up seven times over and over and over again. You were still there. That you don't have a, a number in your head how many times we mess up or how many times we could turn our back on you. And that when we choose to turn around and call out to you that you're still there. God, thank you for not being like us. Thank you for being one that that chooses to love us and continually chooses to show mercy and to show grace. God, thank you for using us and for using broken people to be able to, to shine for you. God, help us to continue to be more like your son. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.